Good morning, everyone. On behalf of our outreach committee, I want to welcome Christy Curl from SOSC. Christy has just returned from Kenya, where the SOSC program runs, and she hadn't been there for over two years. So we're delighted to hear this update, and I, and I just wanted to remind the congregation that we have been supporting SOSC for about 10 years. And the connection goes back to Chris and Patricia Begg, who met Christy, and from there it evolved that Christy came to our church, and we now support this very vital program. Okay, Christy. Thank you, Anna. Well, it took 17 cancelled flights, two years, six months, and 14 days exactly, but I was back on that tarmac in Nairobi. It was such a pinch yourself moment to be welcomed with that view. That view that puts you right in your place, totally humbles you and reminds you of God's majesty and just who is in control. In preparing for this trip, one of my fears was that the relationships that had developed over the past 10, 12 years may have disappeared, that I would find the local community decimated, SOSC's programs in tatters, and me finding that I had to start all over. I needn't have worried. The first few days were very slow as everywhere I went, there were greetings and conversations to be had. Within seconds of parking in town, there was a tap on the car window and there was the smiling, scarred face of one of the beggars calling out, Mama Christine, Mama Christine, you are back long time. You must need to buy lots of cards. Then, of course, there were the slum children who recognised me from the church and from the school, all giggling and calling out, Mama Mzungu, Mama Mzungu, which means white mother. Also, the checkout staff in the supermarket, how they rec recognised me, I don't know, but they welcomed me back and would just say, long time, welcome back. And what surprised me about all of this was that they didn't seem surprised to see me. It was as if they all knew that I would be back at some point. My heart certainly grew 10 sizes with relief. And it didn't stop there. I was stunned to discover that the water filter program continued to play a fundamental role in the lives of those families who'd received the filter and the hygiene education. To refresh, I started the water filter program three years ago. I carry ceramic water filters over to Kenya and working with a local pastor's wife, we select women. We select women who are the most desperate and who would benefit most from having clean, fresh water. Women like Shosho. Shosho of indeterminate age, lives in the shanty area of Navasha. The shanty area is the lowest of low. It is the slum suburb of the slums. Her house is made of rubbish and mud. It sits on an earth floor, on a slope, no electricity, no amenities, and absolutely no security. Shosho has a disability and cannot stand upright, let alone walk very far. But she still bears the responsibility of looking after four grandchildren. She obviously can't work 
and certainly cannot afford fresh water. So, young women and old women. I run a two to three hour workshop. The focus of this workshop is on the prevalence of diseases that occur in Navasha, how those diseases are transmitted, and most importantly, how to prevent that transmission. There are lots of real life, hands-on hygiene activities before I teach the women how to set up and then use their water filter. In my last visit in 2019, the program was still in its infancy and I hadn't had time to evaluate its effectiveness and whether it was worthwhile continuing. This visit, I arranged the program with my last six filters that I'd carried over in my luggage. What thrilled and encouraged me was that word had spread through the slums that I was back and running the program again. While I had six women receiving filters, there were another seven who asked to join the workshop because they'd heard how valuable the information was, particularly through COVID. And one woman also asked to come. Maureen, who is standing in the back row with a black skirt on. Maureen received a water filter in my very first program three years ago. This is Maureen having just received her water filter three years ago. She returned to hear the information over again. The water filter program is definitely one that I will continue. SOSC's slum school program wasn't quite so uplifting. All the Kenyan schools were on a four week vacation, so there were no children. The head teacher, Mary, had changed a phone number and I wasn't able to contact her. So it meant that I could not follow up on any of the children that SOSC had been supporting or just what had happened over the last two years in the school. But visiting the school and seeing the hand painted posters so precisely drawn made me smile. A smile, I have to say, that very quickly disappeared when I opened the door to the second classroom to find it was being used as a chicken coop. It was filthy. The stench, the droppings, the horrid mess, the likelihood of disease was very disheartening. The only flip side of no children at the school meant that I was able to plaster the internal walls of one classroom anyway. This was a job that I'd planned two and a half years ago. Holes had begun to develop in the mortar in between the blocks. And unfortunately, the school building provides a protected location for cannabis growers, users and sellers to thrash the cannabis stems in preparation for drying and then smoking. And of course, while they were enjoying the fruits of their labour, the smoke was finding its way through the holes in the mortar and into the classrooms while classes were running. I was able to plaster one classroom and I have one more to go on my next visit. While I didn't notice a direct human cost of COVID, the economic cost was very visible. Shops were boarded up, market stalls were empty. At the same time, the cost of food and basic amenities had increased dramatically, further limiting the diet options for the majority of locals. This child, is eating what is called ugali, which is a maize meal. In the past, what would normally happen, the children would have maize meal and some sort of vegetable. If they were lucky enough, they would have a meat-based gravy. But now I noticed a difference. They weren't getting the vegetable component. They were surviving on this very, very thick stodge 
full carbohydrate. Theft had also gone through the roof. One of our staff, Gilbert, has now three times had his home, which is a rented room, ransacked in broad daylight. The last time was while he had slipped out to go to the communal bathroom. Each time, the increasingly hefty padlock was destroyed and anything that could be carried away was carried away. Gorgeous, loyal, hard-working Gilbert turned up to work, as you can see, barefooted, wearing the only clothing that he had left. They were the clothes that he had worn to the washroom the night before. Sosk, Sosk's partnership with LBK, which is Life Beads Kenya, also suffered from this economic downturn. This program is where we take in destitute women and street boys. We provide support, counselling and skills training to produce small craft pieces purchased as promotional items to boost flower sales in supermarkets throughout Europe. While 2020 was still buzzing with orders, we received only one order last year. All bar five staff had to be released. There was absolutely nothing to pay their wages. It broke my heart to see SOSC's training centre quiet and empty. But it did grant me unimpeded access to finally install the plumbing, the pumps and the fittings for running water to the centre kitchen and bathrooms. I also spent considerable time discussing options, costs and practicalities for reviving the training centre. It's going to be a very gradual process, but already we have a group of seven orphan girls or young ladies on an eight month course in the centre, learning to operate and repair a sewing machine, as well as professional tailoring. It's a good start. An extremely brief snapshot of an outreach project that you have been so instrumental in supporting. There is so much more that I could share, but that will wait for another time. While there were some disappointments, my visit was overwhelmingly positive. And it was positive because of the people, because of the locals. Their warm and familiar welcome, their maskless hugs and handshakes, their response, their appreciation. Again, I was moved by the Lord's goodness and gentle reminders that he's still with me on this SOSC journey, a journey that I have traveled with your prayers and your generous support for many years. Amen. Thank you, Christine. When I met Christine on Zoom, I realized that I'd met someone who had responded to God's command to love. Participating in God's mission of love is essential to being a Christian. Also, when I heard her this morning, she invoked many emotions. So much of what she's pointed to there, I've experienced myself as I worked quite closely with black people and mixed race people in South Africa, the shanties, the slums, and all those situations. So when I had the opportunity, Anna told me about Christy coming, I thought, why not use her during sermon time? If it had cut the sermon in half and give me only half a sermon to write, which I've done. Each of us, according to our gifting and our opportunities, will share God's word to people. 
And our reason for doing so is the love of God that has touched our lives. Because God has touched our lives, we want to touch others. We do this either consciously or unconsciously. It is natural that when you come and experience profound love, that it, alter, that it alters your life, redirects it. Some of us participate in the, the ministries of God either by building up the church, primarily the community of faith, and others participate in reaching out beyond the church community. But none of us should do either to the exclusion of the other. Our God-given mission is to love in the name of Christ. I've spoken to you about the triangle of love, loving God, loving our neighbor as ourselves. They form a single unity of love. And Jesus emphasized this in the new commandment to his disciples, saying, you must love one another by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's a command that's given to us. Now, we Aussies don't quite like commands. We have put a high order on democracy, our freedom. But the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and God says to us, this is a command, it's not an option. But really, when you are loved, you want to love. And Jesus said something very significant to his disciples. He said, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples by what you do. In the early days of Christianity, Christians not only cared for themselves but for others. Ancient writers testify to this. Tertullian of Carthage wrote in the second century, it is mainly the deeds of, a, of love so noble that lead many to put a brand upon us, a brand upon us. See how they love each other. Eusebius, Eusebius a Christian historian, noted that during the plagues, while people left the, the cities and those who remained behind, possibly the poorer and struggled in life, they would put their sick outside because of the plague. They didn't want to be affected. They put their dead, dead outside in the street and leave them there. And Christians cared indiscriminately for the sick, those of their own and those of the pagan world, at the risk of their own lives. And they were noted for that. The 14th century Emperor Julian, the 4th century, sorry, the 4th century Emperor Julian, a hater of Christianity, encouraged his pagan priests to follow the examples of Christians who cared for our people, he says, as well as theirs. Jesus' words came true in the lives of the faithful Christians who cared indiscriminately for all people they encountered. The compassion of Christians revealed the nature of Christianity, and this naturally led to the growth of the church. We don't care for others with the objective of winning people over, but the fact is the most compelling attraction of the church is that it, that it is a caring community, a compassionate community, a community that cares about justice, And when we care and we are thanked, we should acknowledge that the source of our actions are not ourselves, our own love, but we are motivated, inspired, touched by the love of God in our lives. Otherwise, if we just receive the thanks and not say anything, there is an assumption that the acts of kindness, of compassion and justice come from us but we have been motivated by God, God's loving Christ. 
When I was a school chaplain, I was counseling a parent when she asked me, Peter, why are you giving so of your, your time so generously to me? I suppose the assumption was that I was a school chaplain and I should give my time solely to students. I hesitated for a nanosecond and then said, it's because I love God. And being a preacher, teacher, I just wanted to talk more about God, but I had, I believe, the Holy Spirit whisper, whisper in my ear, get on with the job. So I guess she hardly realized that in a fleeting moment, there's those thoughts had gone through my head. And I went on, we carried on the conversation we were having and working through a few things. The following week, she came along as uh, we arranged and she sat down and the first thing she said to me, she said, Peter, you know what I did last Sunday? A rhetorical question. She proceeded to tell me that she had gone to church for the first time in 19 years and recommitted her life to God. It doesn't always work like that. But the simple thing is, for a moment, I merely named the source of my generosity. I just named it. We are supporting in our outreach ministry in this church generously. It should be generous anyway. And what we are supporting is very important. And we should not forget to praise the one who has inspired us, the source of our love, the source of our inspiration and compassion. All Christian outreach should finally point to God.